So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Teresa for giving me to have a chance to speak here today. And uh, actually, I was born in the States in 1965, so at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So when I was three years old, I came back to Japan, so I don't I didn't have any memory in the United States. That's why, unfortunately, my English is bad, so sorry. for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm doing try to uh, speak in English. So first of all, and also uh, thank you for uh, Christos and Dr. Professor Kim for helping every day, every time. So today I'm going to talk about a recent data of ovarian tissue vitrification uh, and transplantation from annual lab to clinical practice and also introduce current situations on fertility preservation in cancer patients in Japan. What I want to talk about today are as follows. First, uh, I'm going to talk about the problem associated with own fertility in Japan. There are four main problems associated with own fertility in Japan. Uh, first is poor communication between healthcare providers. The second, onco is lack of knowledge of new topics in fertility preservation. The third, doctors of reproductive medicine lack knowledge of new topics in uh, cancer therapy. And fourth, insufficient information for cancer patients regarding fertility preservation. When a young cancer patient actually seeks fertility preservation in Japan, the patient, her attending doctor, is an oncologist, and OBG doctor, mainly doctors of reproductive medicine, will be involved. But communications between the three parties is not always satisfactory. So we have two questions. One is, does right information reach a patient quickly and precisely? Uh, right information and problems shared be between doctors. Yeah, I can think that two uh, pattern of problems associated with unfertility in uh, Japan. OBGY doctors may delay the start of cancer treatment, possibly because of inadequate understanding of anti-cancer therapy and sympathy with yearning of the patient to have a baby. The risk may be greater when there is no direct communication with the oncologist. The other one is oncologist does not have a good understanding of recent advances in reproductive medicine and fertility preservation. Information about fertility preservation is not supplied to the patient. The risk may be greater when there is no direct communication with the OBGYN doctors. So the uh, relationship between the three parties often uh, becomes dependent on communication via the patient. This is a Japan, uh, situation in Japan right now. So problems may be summarized as follows. Unfavorable effect of anti-cancer therapy, which delay in starting therapy or refusal of the treatment by patients. And the second is fertility that might have been preserved is lost. This slide shows the data of 22 years old women with medulloblastoma who came to us because she was concerned about uh, her ovarian lizard or aging. Uh, ice regimen is comprised of cisplatin, ethoposido, and ephosphamide. Uh, these are the considered to be the intermediate risk in gonadotoxicity, as you know. And the patient received ice, seven courses of ice regimen when she was 16 years old and her menstruation has been regular. However, the blood level of AMH and myelin hormone was 2.18 at 22 years of age, which corresponds to that of 35 years old men, women. This patient may experience early menopause so I should tell her this information to her. So in Japan, nobody thought that would happen. So I mean, even this case, so we should change our approach. So this slide shows ASCO 2006 statement. Fertility preservation is not always guaranteed, even when menstrual cycle con continues or resumes. 
The possibility of pregnancy may be reduced or menopause may occur early due to reduction of the ovarian reserve, even in a patient with a regular menstrual cycle. If pregnancy becomes possible after anti-cancer therapy, the window for becoming pregnancy may be limited. So especially oncologists have to understand ASCO 2006 statement enough in Japan, and we should tell them to the patients well. Next, I'd like to introduce a Japanese paper published in 2003 that discussed the gonadotoxicity of taxans, which are considered to be low in toxicity. The authors concluded that nearly 60% of patients experience menopause after 12 courses of weekly paclitaxel at 80 mg per square. It means that paclitaxel is considered to be high in gonadotoxicity. But if you look at mean age of the study, 42.9 uh, years old range from 27 to 51 years old is pretty high for this kind of study. So I'm going to review this report from the view of uh, OBGY doctor. The menopause rate decreased to 14.7% after excluding the 15 premenopausal patients, as shown in this slide. Now I think three patients between 40 and 44 years old are also not suitable for examination. Then if these three patients are also excluded, Menopause rate finally decreased to 5.9%. As we all know well, 90% of the primordial focus is already lost at the age of 35. The patient 35 years old or older is not suitable for such an analysis. We don't say that paclitaxel is considered to be high in gonadotoxicity from the viewpoint of an OBGY doctor. That, uh, that paper was published by uh, oncologist. So next, I'd like to introduce a paper published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. The authors concluded that chemotherapy included amenorrhea improves overall survival and disease-free survival, irrespective of regimen or estrogen receptors. This table shows that the patient background factors, as you can see, Median, median age of this study is 51 years, and this study was analyzed to increase premenopausal patients and even postmenopausal patients. In other words, spontaneous onset of amenorrhea rather than iatrogenic amenorrhea is very likely when such patients are included. After publication of this paper, some maybe OBGY doctor claimed this point and also re-evaluated the result after excluding 217 perimenopausal patients with menstrual irregularity. Luckily, the result obtained by the evaluation, the evaluation was the same as their initial findings. Even in world reading journal like in New England Journal of Medicine, there was such an element, elementary mistake. So oncologists should understand that the presence or absence of menstruation does not reflect the ovarian reserve, and that the ovarian reserve declines rapidly in women over 40 years old. The biggest issue is menstruation, menstruation does not reflect the ovarian reserve, of course, and oncologists need to understand that the number of primordial follicles is the ovarian reserve, and that ovarian function declines with aging. In 2013, the American Society of Clinical Oncology updated the guidelines on fertility preservation for cancer patients, as you know. The updated panel concluded that no major substantive revisions to the 2006 ASCO recommendations were warranted, although various points were clarified. There are main modifications. They used the term of healthcare providers instead of oncologists. And all-site phasing is no longer an experimental procedure. And a bursting, this is a beba seed stimulus, may possibly have ovarian toxicity. According to FDA approval, approval a bursting may possibly have ovarian toxicity. They stated that we should inform females of reproductive po potential of the risk of ovarian failure prior, prior to starting treatment with a bursting. 
FDA said in this clinical trial in ground, the incidence of new cases of ovarian failure was prospectively evaluated in a subset study of 179 women receiving uh, this uh, m 4 fox alone or m 4 fox with Abastin for adjuvant stage 2 and 3 colorectal cancer. But 34 percent of women receiving Abastin in combination with chemotherapy became ovarian failure compared with 2 percent of women receiving chemotherapy alone. There is statistical significant difference in this result. Therefore, Abastin is considered to be a high in gonadotoxicity. But the population of this uh, study, 94% uh, of patients is over 40 years old, even 50 years old. So we can say Abastin is considered to be a uh, uh, high gonadotoxicity. We cannot say. So in other words, spontaneous onset of amenorrhea rather than iatrogenic amenorrhea is very likely when such patients are included. Can we say that Abacin is considered to be high in gonadotoxicity? Should we inform young female cancer patients about ovarian failure prior, prior to starting treatment with Abacin? So that's why we need to establish the Japanese Society for Fertility Preservation. So next, I'd like to talk about the establishment of the medical healthcare network on fertility preservation of young cancer patients in Japan. A non-profit organization, Japan Society for Fertility Preservation, was established in uh, November 2012. Aim of establishing the JSFP is to encourage Japanese oncologists and obituary doctors to newly recognize the concept of oncofertility and share their problems. <coughs> Sorry. They established, to establish the medical healthcare network on fertility preservation to give right information to a patient quickly and precisely, and not to lose the fertility that might have been preserved. The first meeting of JSFP was held at St. Marian University School of Medicine on November 2000. Uh, 12, with the aim of providing a meeting for discussion among the various specialists who had been exchanging opini op opinions at meeting of the Japan Society for Reproductive Medicine and Japan Society of Fertilization and Implantation since 2006. The second meeting of JSAP was held at Tokyo Business Center on January 2013 with the aim of providing a meeting for discussion for enlarging specialists in the field of breast cancer, hematology, pediatrics, and urology, etc. And finally, we held the JSFP Symposium 2013 at Otemach First Square Conference in Tokyo on April 2013 for the first time in Japan. At this symposium, more than 250 participants, including physicians, nurses, and clinical psychologists, discuss the current state of oncofertility in Japan. The concept of JSFP is mainly based on both the Oncofertility Consortium and the International Society for Fertility Preservation. <clears throat> it is a patient-oriented medical health care network rather than a network mediated via the patient. Unfortunately, there are many, many problems to be solved. For example, not so many clinical psychologists in Japan and we don't have navigators such like the Oncofertility Consortium, and also not so enough fund. The JSFP website has a map of Japan, which enables patients to be able to search not only for OBGY doctors, but also for oncologists, including breast cancer, hematologists, oncologists, and specialists managing testicular tumor and other tumors who have agreed to be part of a medical healthcare network for fertility preservation. And also, oncologists can search for appropriate OBGY doctors using JSAP website. Now, uh, this uh, website includes 92 institutes in total. 
So we requested Professor Morishige and Dr. Frui from the Department of Visual Gifu University to construct a medical healthcare network on fertility preservation. Professor Morishige and Dr. Frui are here today. And this uh, network can <coughs> contain uh, 23 hospitals, 48 clinical departments, and 106 members in total, including oncologists, OBGY doctors, and an ex ex executive officer. The network established by Professor Morishige is called GIFU Patients, Oncologists, and Fertility Specialists, GPOFs. And it was announced on TV and in the newspapers as the first regional medical health healthcare, healthcare, uh, on, <coughs> sorry, uh, regional medical network for oncology on fertility in Japan. Patients, patients can also download a leaflet titled for patients starting treatment for breast cancer who wish to become pregnant in the future, which was prepared using research funds from the Japanese government. With the kind <coughs> permission of Professor Udrus, we are currently translating into Japanese an animation, uh, animated patient video about fertility preservation from the website of the Onko Fertility Consortium. Thank you very much, Dr. Teresa. We sincerely appreciate your kindness in helping the JSAP to provide reliable information. <coughs> JSAP has received various advice and guidance from Professor Kim. Professor Kim is immediate past president of the ISAP and has conducted active <coughs> activities to promote collaboration with the JSAP. Actually, I respect uh, Professor Kim very much personally. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. Uh, through various problems, we are going to learn some plans from now on. It's, it's still begun. So I, like, I would really appreciate your help for JSFP. JSFP Symposium 2014 will be held on February 2014 in Tokyo. So it was taken up by a TV program, Today's Close Up, in NHK, Japan Broadcasting Corporation. This TV program is broadcasted uh, 3,300 times since 1993. The title, of this, the title of this program is I Want a Baby Even If I Suffer From a Cancer. And it has been broadcasted on February 25th in 2013. This TV program was the 30 minutes long. long. I edited it to the length of five minutes. So I can show you.治療と妊娠出産を両立しようと各国でがんの専門医と産婦人科医が連携する動きが始まっています。そうです。悩んでいる患者は多く、医師は早急に対処すべきです。がんになっても子供が欲しいという願いにどう答えられるのか。動き出
同時にがん治療の医師とがんの種類や進行度などを検討します医師の間に立ち生殖機能を温存しながら出産するまでの計画を立てます患者が医師から妊娠・出産への影響について十分な説明を受けていない場合直接会って治療やリスクを説明し不安を取り除く心のケアも行います目の前の治療だけでなく私は5年先10年先の話をします患者の治療後の人生を考えているからですネットワークを利用し誕生した子どもはこの2年で30人以上に上りますの子供を授かったゴビカシャップさん乳がんと診断されたその日のうちにネットワークから産婦人科医を紹介してもらい一月後には卵子を取り出しましたそして医師同士が連携しがんの状態を慎重に見極めながら出産を実現したのですがん専門医と産婦人科医がしっかりした協力体制で支援してくれますその協力にとても感激しました今も再発の不安などについてナビゲーターに相談に乗ってもらい子育てを続けていますネットワークは7年前妊娠・出産を望む患者の声を受け産婦人科医たちが立ち上げましたその後全米のがん専門医を巻き込んでいったのですこれまでは医師の世界は縦割りで他の分野と連携することはありませんでした互いが信頼しコミュニケーションを取れればがん患者の妊娠・出産を支える体制はどの国でもできますアメリカ政府はネットワークに日本円にしておよそ1億5000万円を支援し国を挙げて医療の連携を後押ししていますアメリカを手本に日本でも連携の動きが始まりました今月岐阜県のがん専門医と産婦人科医およそ70人が集まり日本で初めてがん治療と生殖医療を結ぶネットワークを立ち上げたのです大学病院に専門の外来を設置患者が訪ねれば妊娠・出産の手助けをする医療機関を紹介しますアメリカでは産婦人科医とがん専門医との連携がネットワークができているようですけれども改めてなぜこの連携が大事なんですか、えっと So after this TV program, some Japanese audiences, this year's program, I was really impressed by the health care network on fertility preservation proposed by on fertility consortium in the United States. So I hope that this kind of network system will be established as soon as possible in Japan for the young cancer patients. So the JSAP has prepared a textbook on on fertility in Japanese, which was published in just last month. We sincerely thank Teresa for writing the preface in this textbook. So, next, <coughs> I will、uh, change the topics. The current、uh, topics of ovarian tissue vitrification in Japan. Several studies have shown that ovarian tissue can be successfully frozen and grafted in humans. Based on Dr. Donay's review, ovarian cortex cryopreservation should be offered before gonotoxic chemotherapy in all cases where there is a high risk of POF and where emergency IVF is not possible. Until now, there are approximately 30 live births after transplantation of frozen sold ovarian tissue. As you know, the standard method of ovarian tissue cryopreservation is slow freezing at present. This slide shows the pros and cons of vitrification stated by Dr. Hobata in World Congress on Fertility Preservation 2009. According to her statement, 
Growth of vitrification are excellent survival of ovarian stroma and blood vessels, a first method, no particular apparatus needed, also feasible clinically <coughs> excellent survival in tissue culture. On the other hand, cons of vitrification are no rivals reported so far. It requires good training, concentrations and osmolarities, and the speed of the procedure are of extremely, extremely, extremely high importance. <coughs> Toxic influence on the tissue are possible if less trained personnel. Therefore, we planned the preclinical pre study for established ovarian vitrification method since 2006. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation has already become a common fertility preservation method in Europe and the United States and performed for almost 2,000 patients since 1998. <clears throat> also, approximately 30 live births were achieved since 2004. Professor Donay stated that, indeed, in the coming years, we are looking <clears throat> essentially to improve freezing techniques and enhance the vascular bed before implantation. To, increasing, <coughs> to increase pregnancy rate. The present study was performed on cyanomorgus monkeys with the objective of determining the, the optim, optimum site for heterotopic autotransplantation of ovarian cortex and optimum method of cryopreservation to enhance the clinical application of this method. First of all, we performed transplantation using the fresh ovarian cortex of two monkeys to determine the optimum site for heterotopic autotransplantation. After resection of the bilateral ovaries, the ovarian cortex was minced into 0.5 cm cubes for heterotopic autotransplantation into the lateral peritoneum, the omentum, and the subcutaneous tissue of the back. The recovery of hormone cycle was confirmed on day 64. Superpopulation was induced after administration of a DNRH agonist for two weeks, and the presence or absence of follicle development at the sites of ovarian tissue was assessed on day 326. Eventually, recovery of the hormone cycle was confirmed again 60 days after oocyte pickup. Thereafter, the second oocyte pickup was performed on day 935 after initial autotransplantation. As a result, one developed follicle was found by abdominal ultrasound in the lateral peritoneal iliac fossa at the site separate from the uterus. <coughs> developed follicles were confirmed macroscopically in the left lateral peritoneal iliac fossa region at laparotomy. And also aggregates of developed follicles were found in the omentum. Finally, mature oocytes were successfully collected from the both heterotopic transplanted to site. After microfertilization of the harvested ova, five embryos were obtained. Four of these five embryos grew from the 32 cell stage to form moruras. Finally, we established an appropriate method of heterotopic autotransplantation using fresh ovarian cortex tissue in the monkeys. Therefore, we started to develop the ovarian tissue vitrification method. At first, we investigated the effect of vitrification solutions and equilibration time on the morphology of vitrified preantral follicles in cyanomorgus monkey to decide the optimal condition of the ovarian tissue vitrification. We, we compared two types of vitrification solutions, such as VSEGP solution and VSED solution, as you can see in this slide. In this in addition, we examined it in five minutes 10 minutes and 20 minutes at equilibrium time. This slide shows the examination of result by light microscopy. As you can see in the upper section of this slide, most of oocytes in VSEGP group were surrounded by compact ovarian stroma, similarly to control. On the other hand, a lot of severely damaged oocytes can be seen in VSEG group. The proportion of morphologically normal follicles vitrified in VVS EGP for five minutes was significantly higher than that of follicles vitrified in VVS ED for five minutes. On the other hand, longer exposure time to VVS ED significantly increased the proportion of morphologically normal follicles, 
but no differences were observed in between two solutions. This slide shows the examination result by transmission electron microscopy. The proportion of morphologically normal mitochondria in oocyte vitrified after five minutes exposure to VS EGP was similar to that in non vitrified oocyte, and that was significantly greater than in oocyte vitrified after five minutes exposure to VSED. Finally, we decided to use the VS EGP solution for five minutes at equilibrium time. HN glycol is the most commonly used and widely accepted permeable cryoprotectant for vitrification procedures, and it shows low toxicity but rapid diffusion into cells. Macromolecules such as PVP or the sugar can act as non permeable cryoprotectants. Increasing water withdrawal from cells and decreasing cryoprotectant exposure time. Reduced exposure time to a cryoprotectant is vital to support the viability of oocyte in ovarian tissue. Next, we try to establish the new vitrification method using straw. This is closed, or new device, cryo support. This is open. We made. First of all, we compared the normality of preantral follicles after freezing in between three methods. As you can see, based on the result of light mass microscopy, Cryo support vitrification could support the morphology of frozen preantral follicles significantly better than straw vitrification and straw freezing. However, according to the result of transmission electron microscopy regarding the lysosome oocyte cytoplasmic area ratio, no differences were observed between non frozen cryo support vitrification and straw vitrification. Usually, vitrification does not require a programmed freezer and ice sealing medium and it is simpler than the slow freezing method. Thereafter, we used these two vitrification methods in seven cyanomonas monkeys as for the clinical study. Recently, Dr. Amorium reported the results that examined the optimal condition of the vitrification method using the human ovarian tissue. Dr. Amorium stated that vitrification solution containing HN glycol as a less toxic Fast penetrating cryoprotectant, better than DMSO, same as our result. And the membrane stabilizing disaccharide, trihalose, and fetal bovine serum as a complex protective agent does not affect follicular morphology. Strobes may yield a lower cooling rate because they are made of plastic, a non conductive material, which probably have a negative impact on the cooling. And in 2012, Dr. Amaury published another data of vitrification solution using human body and tissues. Vitrification, on the other hand, in recent years, there have been various reports on the superiority of the vitrification method, as I show you. Professor Hobata reported that the tissue showed significantly better preservation with vitrification based on observation by electron microscopy after freezing human body and tissue compared with slow freezing. Dr. Tsarinsky have published excellent data just recently in human reproduction. As Dr. Tsarinsky presented this morning, HN glycol and glycerol are accepted for cryoprotectant, not DMSO, same as our opinion. This slide shows a summary of composition contents of variant vitrification solution recently published in the paper. And this slide shows the result of systematic estrogen and progesterone levels after heterotopic transplantation using straw vitrification method. The recovery of hormone cycle was confirmed on day 78. We con could have confirmed the hormone cycle up to day 716 after transplantation. Hormone cycle was also recovered in the other two monkeys by straw vitrification. And also, we could confirm the recovery of hormone cycle by cryo support vitrification, as you can see in this slide. Finally, no differences were seen in the recovery of hormone cycle between two methods, which is uh, uh, open and cro uh, closed type. The stable risk experimental result using vitrified ovarian cortex from seven monkeys. Median duration for which transplanted ovarian tissue recovered to function was 151 months. Sorry, 151 days. 
Finally, we developed a new ovarian tissue vitrification method using straw and cryo support. The distribution of blood vessels at the site of heterotopic transplantation was examined by contrast enhanced CT using monkey number five on the day before overcorrection after induced superpopulation. This slide showed contrast enhancement of the transplanted ovarian tissue present in the mesosalpinx on the right side of the uterus and in the omentum in the left lower abdomen. Images of de developing follicles were observed in the two transplanted ovarian tissues. The result of the contrast enhanced CT showed that blood was supplied from the right uterine artery to the transplanted ovarian tissue in the mesosalpinx and from the left gastroepiploic artery to the transplanted ovarian tissue in the omentum. In the comparison of plain CT and contrast enhanced CT, significant contrast enhancement by blood flow to all heterotopically transplanted ovarian tissue was observed. Distribution of newer blood flow <coughs> from the uterine artery, mesenteric artery, and left gastroepiploic artery was confirmed. And this slide shows the photo of the intraperitoneal findings at harvesting of ova on the day after the CT examination. Developing follicles were observed visually in the heterotopically. Transplanted ovarian tissue with three in the momentum, one in the left iliac fossa, and one in the right mesosalpinx. Finally, four ova were successfully harvested from momentum and right mesosalpinx, excluding the developing follicles in the ovarian tissues in the left iliac fossa. This slide shows This slide shows the 3D CT image, and we can confirm the distribution of newer blood flow to the transplanted ovarian tissue. As you can see in this slide, we can confirm the distribution of newer blood flow, uterine artery, gastroepiploic artery, as you can see. Correction of OBA was attempted from omentum, mesosalpinx, retropetan region, and uterine serosa with 9M2 stage over being success successfully harvested from the heterotopically transplanted vitrified ovarian tissue. Microfertilization was performed on the same day, achieving fertilization of 6 over. And finally, the 4 out of 6 embryos grew from the 8 cell stage to from, from 16 cell stage. To summarize, we established an appropriate method of auto-transplantation using ovarian cortex in primates by vitrification. Our findings <coughs> may also provide useful information for the clinical application of heterotopic auto-transplantation in patients without residual ovaries. The IRB of St. Marian University School of Medicine approved our clinical study of auto-transplantation using vitrified human ovarian cortex at the end of 2009. And we have started to use this technique for clinical application since 2010. This slide shows the indication of variant tissue cryopreservation in your institution. Patients age, uh, cancer, and gonadotoxic therapy in our institution in this slide. Risk of transferring malignancy cells with transplant frozen strong, frozen salt ovarian tissue, which is Minimal residual disease in ovarian tissue is the danger that we should evade most. This slide shows the risk of ovarian metastasis according to cancer types, reported by Professor Doman in 2013. The risk is classified as high, medium, and low. Low risk disease. And early infiltrating ductal carcinoma and Hodgkin's disease are classified as low risk of transferring malignant cells. As shown here, leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are not suitable targeted disease for ovarian tissue cryopreservation because ovarian metastasis has been confirmed. This slide shows the age-specific incidence and mortality rate of breast cancer in Japan uh, between two, 19, 1999, 1990 to, and 2009. As you can see, incidence and mortality rate of breast cancer are also increasing in Japan. Especially the incidence is particularly high among those of childbearing age between 30 and 39 years old. 
Since January 2010, we have performed ovarian tissue vitrification in a total of 83 patients. The details are shown on this slide. As the ovaries of breast cancer patients have very little chance of metastasis, and also the incidence of young patients is increasing, I think this method is most suitable for this kind of patient in Japan. Laparoscopic ovariectomy is performed in three-day hospitalization. Usually one whole ovary is removed and then cut into the several pieces of the ovarian cortex tissues of the size of the one centimeter in height, one centimeter in width, and one millimeter thickness. We always confirm the follicular presence and the minimal radial disease in the ovarian tissue by HE staining. At the time of ovarian sampling, visible follicles can be taken from the ovarian tissue, and then oocyte retrieval is done by follicular <coughs> trimming. Thereafter, oocytes are grown in culture until the oocytes are mature. For a married patient, oocytes are then fertilized by ICSI being, before being frozen, whereas mature oocytes are frozen for an unmarried patient. We can asp <coughs> aspirate follicles from the remaining ovary during the operation wherever possible. The table in this slide shows the maturation rate of immature oocyte taken from ovarian tissue. 66 oocyte became mature out of 133 retrieved oocyte from visible follicles, which size is 2 to 5, centi 5 millimeter in diameter, and the maturation rate was 49.6%. The table in this slide shows the fertilization, fertil fertilization rate that were <coughs> grown and underwent maturation in vitro and were able to fertilize by ICSI. Finally, the fertilization rate in eight patients was 48%. As of September 2013, operant tissue cryopreservation and transplantation was approved by the relevant IRB and actually performed at eight centers in Japan. Operant tissue cryopreservation was done for 100 uh, 14 patients, and 30 patients received ovarian transplantation. Vitrification is the standard ovarian cryopreservation method in Japan, and also topic transplantation, including tube oviduct, is performed in most cases. So, however, it should be remembered that appropriate action must be taken for the underlying disease, and cancer therapy should be prioritized. So young female cancer patients have fear of the future due to cancer, as well as fear of the future related to loss of fertility because they are young. A medical health care network should be established in which oncologists and OBGY doctors have in-depth knowledge about cancer therapy and reproductive medicine, allowing them to educate patients and provide psychological support. This slide shows the cover of JSFP website. We hope this website becomes the very useful thing for patients with cancer in Japan. I always think that it is important to know that right information about fertility preservation by a right timing to get over the treatment of cancer is hope as for cancer patients. Last but not the least, we transplanted vitrified salt ovarian tissue into the oviduct and collected over from two patients. Here I, here I can report that we have successfully obtained fertilized human eggs using ovarian vitrification method for the first time in the world. And eventually, this patient successfully became pregnant and gave a live birth last year in Japan. This is a first uh, live birth uh, using vitrified salt ovarian dish, I think. This I show the take-home message from uh, today's talk. On November 3rd, 2012, the Japan Society for Fertility Preservation, JSFP, was founded as a non-profit organization with the aim of organizing the medical healthcare network on fertility preservation to give right information to a young cancer patient quickly and precisely. It is necessary to share various old and new issues regarding the management of fertility preservation in cancer patients among healthcare professionals from multiple specialists involved in oncofertility medicine. And ovarian tissue vitrification may be a promising new method for clinical application in the field of fertility preservation. I'd like to acknowledge all the members in our project in this slide. And thank you for your attention. Sorry about my English. <laughs> Very
very much for that presentation and for the presentation of the live birth from vitrified ovarian tissue. Congratulations on that achievement. Are there uh, questions uh, for Dr. Suzuki before we go to our reception? I thought so. <laughs> Dr. Zelensky. I'd also like to congratulate you on the first birth in Belgium. You told us you did the transfer and we've been waiting and waiting to hear. So. That's really wonderful news for you and the patient. It's great. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, what is your strategy for um, transplanting the tissue as far as um, retrieving the oocyte or having natural conception occur or whatever works? Oh, uh, yeah. So, after trying to do natural conception, of course, uh, first of all, we should wait for the natural menstruation. And after the, uh, trying to uh, receive natural conception, then finally I'm going to transplant ovarian tissue. But it depends on the uh, age of the patient, I think. So uh, which is better? How do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, whatever works. <laughs> yes. IVF? Yeah, yeah. We, do, we do IVF yeah. too. Um, so in this patient that got uh, pregnant and gave birth, you put the pieces in the mesosalpinx or right into yes. the oviduct? In the yes. mesosalpinx, okay. Yes. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. Dr. Gracia. Hi, that was very interesting. Great work. Um, I had a question about um, ovarian stimulation. I, I see a lot of the patients who are selecting, electing to do ovarian tissue acquired preservation are breast cancer patients, which actually is not the case in the States. We hardly ever do it for breast cancer because often those patients are stimulated and we freeze eggs or embryos on those patients. What is the philosophy in Japan? So tissue versus eggs or embryos for breast cancer. Uh, yeah. It also depends on the type of luminary type, luminary type, which is a uh, progesterone and estrogen receptor mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. in, this, in that case, we don't do the uh, ovarian stimulation. But uh, if the patient uh, with like uh, triple negative type or uh, no uh, receptor uh, positive, in that case, uh, we can do the uh, ovarian uh, stimulation. Okay. Here we stimulate women even if they're estrogen receptor positive generally, but often we use, you know, medications like letrozole, aromatase inhibitors to reduce the hormone levels. I guess there's not a lot of evidence L about like the safety, the you know, if it's really safe mm -hmm. in the long run, but the evidence there is we at least feel comfortable. So I thought that was an interesting difference in practice. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again very much for the stimulating keynote speech and for the presentation of the new data on your live birth. Congratulations again on that achievement.